So first of all, as Steve mentioned, the embarrassing fact is that I joined the faculty, well, come the end of this year, I'll have been on the Cal campus for 40 years. I've never practiced my craft anyplace else. And as you'll see, a number of the vignettes that I'm going to tell you about today have to do with other faculty whose first appointment and last appointment has been here at UC Berkeley. Um, once you're here, you never want to leave. So I also want to acknowledge the debt that I owe to the people who came before me, the faculty that made this a very fertile place for me to set down my roots, and that includes the late Seymour Fogel and the late Robert K. Mortimer, two of the giants who established the modern era of yeast genetics. It includes Jesse C. Rabinowitz, uh, also who has passed away, but, but uh, Clinton E. Ballou, two of the giants of yeast biochemistry. Um, the word enzyme, the, the, the catalyst carry out the chemistry inside cells, comes from the Greek enzymos in yeast. So yeast was the first organism which was realized that there were such catalysts that carried out biological processes. So I owe a great debt to those guys, and I hope that in the same way, my coming here in 1974 also established a foundation for some of the younger fellows, they're not so young anymore like me, but uh, that helped them in the same way nurtured their work. Um, so to start off, though, of course, uh, definitions always help. And you're here because most of you want to find out <coughs> what is a yeast and what's it good for. And you've all passed by places in the supermarket where there are aluminum foil packets or jars of Fleischmann yeast or Red Star or other brands of yeast that bakers use. But what's, it, what's actually in the jar in those packets? And yeast is a single cell micro. And the particular yeast we're going to discuss in detail today is only one species of many, but it's uh, in the class of fungi. Yeasts are single cell fungi. Many other fungi grow very filamentous or grow in colonies. You've all seen bread mold, lots of old pieces of bread. Those are also fungi. But the name Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it's sort of a bastardization of both Latin and Greek. But it means sugar, saccharo, mices, fungi, fungus, uh, cerevisiae of beer. Cerveza por favor, that's the Spanish for uh, beer. And that's where the name comes from. And it's got other aliases too. Uh, it's referred to as budding yeast for obvious reasons. The way this organism propagates, instead of each cell growing in size and splitting in half, what happens is it puts out a little bleb on the surface and that grows in size until it reaches approximately the size of its progenitor cell, which is referred to as the mother cell. And this part is referred to as the bud, and it's budding yeast. And then when it reaches sufficient size, it buds and creates two cells. But it's been used for millennia by bakers and by brewers. And different variants of this yeast are better for one of these processes or the other. And we'll talk about that briefly. But yeast cells are typically eukaryotic. What do we mean by that? Well, in large measure, the living world is divided up into two kinds of organisms. So-called prokaryotes that include the bacteria and the archaea. And they have their DNA sort of like a spool of yarn just floating around in the cytoplasm of their very small cells. Whereas eukaryotic cells are larger, and they're divided up into compartments. They put all their chromosomes in this double membrane structure called the nucleus. They have little power stations called the mitochondria, here marked with M, that generate the energy, ATP, that cells need. They have machinery to make uh, degradative enzymes that reside here in the vacuole. It's the yeast equivalent of a, of a mammalian organelle called the lysosome. And, and other uh, membrane-bound compartments that we'll talk about more in detail that are required for the production of proteins that are embedded in these membrane compartments and to be secreted out of the cell. And this is virtually the same structure as, as a human cell has. We package our chromosomes in a nucleus. We have mitochondria. We segregate our chromosomes on a mitotic spindle. So yeast are typical eukaryotes of that sort. And that's what's one of the things that's made it a good experimental organism. It has all of the same 
morphological and behavioral features of much more complicated, the cells and much more complicated organisms, yet it's a single celled organism. Okay, when it, when it does do its division, when it separates the bug from the mother, it leaves behind a trace, and that trace is called the bud scar. And you can see on the surface of this mother cell, it's generating another bud. There's a bud scar here, and a bud scar there, and a bud scar there. So you can actually count up the number of times this cell has undergone division. So you can think of this as uh, uh, multiple navels. You know, the, the, you're all, each of us is born with a, a navel for that reason. And this, this bud will have a birth scar. It'll be the inverse of the bud scar. And then as it starts to go and divide, it'll have bud scar. And as you can see from this book, which was published a few years ago by another colleague of ours, Hitton Madani, he's a professor across the bay at UCSF, um, yeast is being used as a model for all sorts of things. In this case, the emphasis was on how cells differentiate and change from one form to another. Now, we can use yeast as a tractable experimental organism for genetics because it undergoes sex. And despite its deceptively simple lifestyle as a unicellular organism, it actually comes in three distinct cell types. There are two haploid cells. One of them, the class of cells, is called A cells. And the other class of cells is called alpha cells. It's a terrible nomenclature. You know, it's hard to distinguish A from alpha. Why didn't they call them X and Y or A and B? But I can't change it. That's the history. So there are A cells and alpha cells. And each of these is able to grow and divide perfectly happily out into an item if you give it fresh medium. But the striking thing is if you mix a batch of A cells together with a batch of alpha cells, the cells stop growing. They change their shape in a very pronounced way. This shape change has been referred to as the shmoo. For all of you in the room here are pretty much, maybe not you, but everybody with the amount of gray hair I have remembers Al Cap in the schmooze in Little Abner, and somebody thought that these yeast cells looked like the schmoo characters from Little Abner, so henceforth, these have always been called, in the technical literature you can see it, it's used as a verb, a noun, an adjective. This is a schmoo, they look very schmooey, did the cell schmoo? Uh, so it's, it's very useful. And the central players in this whole process is the, these two little molecules here, I haven't shown their structure or anything, but the A cells generate a secreted lipoprotein. It's a short little protein called A factor, very imaginatively named. It's made by the A cells. And the alpha cells make a different molecule. It's 13 amino acids long. You guessed it named alpha factor, very imaginatively named. But these basically act like hormones. Uh, because they're produced by an individual of the species and change the behavior of another individual of the species, they're more properly referred to by zoo zoologists as pheromones. But uh, the A cells release A factor pheromone, and that triggers in the alpha cells all the events of differentiation that turn it from a cell undergoing mitotic growth, vegetative proliferation, into a cell that has the properties of a gamete. And likewise, the alpha factor induces in the A cells, all the changes necessary in its surface, in its shape, in its behavior to be a gamete. So basically, the action of these two hormones converts these two into basically eggs and sperm. Hard to tell who's who, based on morphology, but it's the equivalent. And these cells have the capacity to fuse and form the third cell type, the diploid. And you can see how having mutants of this type, or mutants of this type, and mixing them together, we can look at the shuffling of those traits and uh, how, the, how they get mixed up in the diploid, and that's the basis for which we do yeast genetics. But these two molecules are going to figure prominently in what we're talking about today. Well, that's, that's all well and good. That's a little bit about the biology and the behavior of the, of the organism itself. But why has yeast been so beneficial to humankind over... Yes, question? Can we go back? Sure. Um, if you took just A cells, did you... Propagate those separate from mine? Yeah, if I, if I took a, a culture of these and just put, kept 40, transferring it into fresh medium all the time, it would be basically but, immortal. And they would never turn into alpha cells. Well, never is a very long time. And no, that's an interesting process how in they, itself. How, you, how did you originally get two different lines in the first place, unless you had some kind of split? 
Um, well, that's in this diploid. Remember, a diploid undergoes what's known as meiosis. So it duplicates its DNA, but then it divides twice. So it starts off with. If that's after, what came before the A? A now? How do they start? Uh, that is a chicken and the egg problem that I cannot answer. How and why did yeast come to evolve two separate mating types? Well, if, what if you separate it out two lines, would they, would they die off? You're, you're asking about a really important nuance of yeast biology. So there are strains of yeast that are known as homophallic, and they do exactly what you're saying. They have a nuclease that makes a break in the DNA and allows a silent copy of the other mating type information to go into it and be it expressed at a locus. And so if you propagate A cells, some of them turn into alpha cells and then they can mate and they all diploidize. And that's why it was called homophallic strain because all the cells would eventually form diploids because you get A's and alphas. In the lab, to keep them apart, to keep them from doing that, we use strains that are so-called homophallism minus. They have a mutation in that endonuclease, which is called the HO endonuclease, and so they can't undergo that mating type switching. But wild, you're absolutely right. Wild type yeast cells undergo mating type switching and keep the thing. So the both, is both not cells. necessarily genetically exact. Only mothers switch mating type. Uh, that's an interesting fact about, but anyway. Uh, it, it's really a detail that's exciting and interesting, and it, and it tells us something about how stem cells are propagated and, and all that. But, yeah? Just a much simpler question. If yeah. you buy a packet of baker's yeast, do you have both types of ah, packet? Uh, baker's yeast are even more exotic. They, they're actually tetraploid and sometimes octoploid. The more, the more sets of, and that's done by other genetic tricks. The, more, the, the greater the number of chromosomes that they all have, the more robust the growth of the cells, the larger they are. And uh, this, this gets us to the, this business. Um, those strains are very robust in metabolizing sugar. And the faster you make the sugar into the products that yeast turns it into, uh, the better the bread dough rises. So. Baker's yeasts are fast fermenters. They take the sugar in grains or fruits or whatever and turn that sugar into ethanol and CO2 very rapidly so you get a lot of air bubbles so you get nice fluffy bread. Brewer's yeasts are variants of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, actually usually called Saccharomyces carlsbergensis. They do this very slowly, settle to the bottom of the tank, do it slowly over time, and make all sorts of other nuanced fermentation, a little glycerol here, a little acetate there, a little lactate, and give the, the wine some secondary metabolism, as well as the ethanol. So that's the reason why yeast has been so utilized over millennia by, by civilization, because it's able to take sugar and make ethanolic product and CO2 at the same time. So I'll pose a question for the audience. How come you don't get drunk when you eat a slice of bread? You're making ethanol. Somebody take a guess. It goes off when you eat it. Right, exactly. You bake the bread in the oven. Ethanol is very volatile, so it all comes off in the oven. If you want to stand over your oven and breathe, then you can get done. <laughs> um, but of course, if we keep it in solution like we do when we brew a big vat of beer or wine, the ethanol stays in solution and we get wonderful products like wine and beer. So that's the general use that most people are familiar with for this particular organism and variants thereof. And as I said, when, uh, the question Ed asked was, um, you know, the commercial yeasts just do this process very robustly, and so they make a lot of gas very fast. So in what other ways is yeast being manipulated to give us other benefits and insights that we can use for uh, improvement of our health, uh, betterment of our economy, that sort of thing. So I could have spent the whole lecture uh, talking about what's going on across the street here. Uh, we have something called an Energy Biosciences Institute, where one of the major aims is to improve the efficiency of ethanol production by yeast, to improve how efficiently we utilize biomass 
that's available that would otherwise go unused so that we have an alternative form of energy. And there are lots of scientists over in the EBB, the Energy Biosciences Building, literally right across the street, the new building you might have seen go up over the last few years, that are doing exactly that, trying to engineer yeast strains that use different sugars in, and make them uh, be able to degrade different aspects of the breakdown products of various kinds of cellulose, and lignin, and hemicellulose, so that, so that there's much more efficient production of the ethanol at a cheaper price at lower energy expense. But what I decided to do instead today is to tell you four vignettes, four stories, if you will, that have to do with a more medical perspective as opposed to a bioenergy uh, perspective. And so if you'll bear with me, I hope in the, in the time that we have, we'll, we'll talk about how yeast is uh, being used in these areas. So. First of all, I wanted to talk about diabetes, uh, especially type 1 diabetes, often referred to as juvenile diabetes, is due to the inability of a human being to make sufficient levels of this molecule. This is a so-called ribbon diagram. The amino acids in the polypeptide chain are depicted as a swivel, and wherever you see this corkscrew, it means that the amino acids in the chain are arranged in something called an alpha helix. Not surprising since it looks like a little helix. And human insulin is actually a very strange molecule. It's made up of two little pieces. This blue chain is called the B chain, and then this orange or goldish thing, blue and gold, look at that. anyway, um, is referred to as the A chain. And they're linked together by these bonds, these yellow things, which are called disulfide bonds, but it doesn't really matter. Basically, they're two pieces of string that are tied together by cross-links. So, from what we understand about how genes are expressed and our proteins are made, it's hard to see how you actually make and secrete such a molecule. Now, these molecules, human insulin, are made by one cell type and only one cell type in our body. They're made by certain cells in our pancreas called beta cells. And a Nobel Prize was given to George Pilati his, one of his co-workers, uh, for figuring out the pathway that a newly made protein makes in traversing from inside the cell and getting itself inside these secretory granules. And when your body gets the right signal, like you eat a sugar-rich meal, your beta cell get the signal to dump some of these packets these little vesicles that have insulin stored in them fuse with the plasma membrane and dump their contents into the circulation. But how a molecule gets into these little packets and, and how it traverses this and how it matures and becomes that insulin molecule that I showed you on the previous slide was really not understood. So, <coughs> this is where our recent Cal Nobel Prize winner comes in. Randy Wayne Sheckman, uh, when he joined the faculty two years after me, he set one of his goals trying to understand the mechanism, the genes and the proteins encoded by those genes that are responsible for setting up the way stations all along the secretory pathway, how a protein gets made in the cytoplasm inside the cell, but then gets through a membrane, it's actually into the lumen of this compartment called the endoplasmic reticulum. So here's, here's a structure, this blue thing is what's called a ribosome, and it's making a newly made chain, this black thing, and it's, it enters inside this lumen, and then it gets packaged in a vesicle, and then that gets transferred and fuses with this other membranous compartment called the Golgi, and then other vesicles leave the Golgi and become those secretory granules like in the pancreatic beta cell, and then those have the capacity to fuse with the plasma membrane and go outside the cell. And the beauty of using yeast is defects in all of these stages in secretion can be isolated as mutants that behaved in certain predictable ways. And so that's what all these numbers mean, that Randy and Peter Novick, his first graduate student, and Charlie Field, the late Charlie Field, who was his first technician, 
um, identified all of these SEC genes, secretion defective genes, and they knew that SEC 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 15, all those genes, when you had a mutation in the cells accumulated huge numbers of these vesicles. So they knew it was the last step that was blocked. Because normally yeast cells, once they make these vessels, okay, they fuse and dump their contents and go on their way. Whereas mutants, for example, in SEC7 and SEC14, in a mutation in a gene we isolated that Randy then studied, uh, makes a phosphatidyl and acetyl 4 kinase, but that doesn't really matter. It just uh, does a job. Uh, mutants in these things accumulate very large amounts of these Golgi compartments, as if there's no way to convert to butt off some of the material and make these vesicles. So they swell up. And likewise, it all steps along this pathway. And so, as you heard from Steve, just beginning of this month, we got the exciting announcement that Randy was one of the three recipients this year of the 2013 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And I use this slide to point out that Randy came in 1976, and he's been here a golden bear ever since. Whereas some of the other recipients, you know, even Stanford couldn't keep this guy happy, and neither could Princeton or Sloan Kettering Cancer Center or Columbia University, and finally he went back to his alma mater, a conquering hero. He got his undergraduate degree at Yale. And even Tom Sudoff, he did most of his work for more than 20 years at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, although he was an emigre from Germany. No surprise, I'm too rough. Um, but you know, Stanford knows a winner when they see it, and uh, they recruited him to their faculty, knowing that sometime in the near future he would probably get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> but you know, it's a wonderful life, and Randy uh, knows it, and uh, so he's been there ever since. But you know, each of them has contributed in different ways. Randy's mainly genetic analysis defined the gene products of that Rothman was more of a biochemist. And Sudhoff showed that all of the proteins that Randy found in yeast and that Jim defined biochemically are also true in the nervous system, even in as complex a structure as the neurons in our brain use exactly the same proteins to make the synaptic vesicles that dump neurotransmitters into our gap junction. So that's why, collectively, they got the prize. But here at Berkeley, the motivation for getting a Nobel Prize is not just the science, frankly, as we all know. <laughs> here is a very valuable piece of real estate. It's called a parking space on Central Campus. And you probably can't read what that sign says, but so I'll blow it up for you. But it says, reserved for Nobel laureate. Now, you might think, for the privilege of being a faculty member at Cal, promoted to tenure, you'd get a free parking space anyway. No, you have to work here at least 12 years, and then you get the right to spend over $1,200 a year to have an access to a parking space. Whereas if you get a Nobel Prize, you get a free parking space designated for you, nobody else, for life. Very strong motivating factor. Of course, it's the science. But I digress. <laughs> Going back to insulin, one of the things that one of my scientific heroes, Don Steiner at the University of Chicago, showed uh, right around the time that I was joining the faculty is that insulin is made on a larger so called precursor protein. That it's actually made as a long continuous polypeptide, and during the process of its biogenesis and secretion from the cell, its little N-terminal baggage ticket that gets it from the cytoplasm into the lumen of the ER membrane gets clipped off. And then those disulfide bonds that join the A and uh, B chains form, and there's even another bond that makes the A chain fold up in a particular way. And then this business in the middle, this so-called C chain, is excised, and that leaves behind the molecule that I showed you that had the blue corkscrews and the gold corkscrews connected by the yellow links, the disulfide bonds. But nothing was known about the enzymes that made all these cuts and trims to actually excise the business part of insulin out of the larger precursor. So this is where our story goes back to the yeast mating pheromones. In my work, I showed that 
Yeast alpha factor is processed from a larger precursor polypeptide, just like insulin. And that we had defined one of the enzymes needed to trim the excess baggage off of that precursor. Most importantly, one of my best graduate students ever, David Julius, uh, he's now a chairman of the Department of Physiology at UCSF and a member of the National Academy. Um, he, we also discovered the enzyme that makes the internal things, the molecular scissors that cut the important pieces of the precursor out. And with Randy, we also showed how that precursor and where in the pathway all of those steps that are catalyzed by the enzymes we discovered actually occur. So we knew that in large measure the processing of this yeast hormone was very much like the processing and secretion of a mammalian hormone like insulin that's so important for the metabolism of so many people. So we worked out this pathway where we had a bigger precursor and these little bite-sized pieces of alpha factor are carved out. It's a four for one special. There are four repeats of the pheromone inside each precursor molecule. And so then it was sort of a no-brainer. Could we take advantage of all the information in the leader sequence of alpha factor and just substitute the alpha factor portion with what we knew to be the important part of the precursor of insulin. And so, could yeast expressing this hybrid protein, this fusion protein, actually make and secrete human insulin? Yes! Randy, myself, another colleague who will come up shortly, Jasper Ron, Seymour Fogel, whose name I mentioned at the beginning, we're all recruited by a company that was based in Emeryville called Chiron Corporation. And we worked out this process and made it happen. And then Chiron was bought by C. Begaye and uh, other, and they were changed to Novartis and uh, you know, everybody uh, benefited. But in the meantime, um, Chiron sold this process to a Danish company, Novo Nordisk. So Novo Nordisk was famous for extracting insulin from pigs because pig insulin differs from our bodies in only one amino acid. So it takes a very long time for our bodies to raise antibodies and recognize it as foreign, but eventually our bodies do. So it's much better for a human to get pure human, real, authentic, no differences from the natural form of insulin, which is what we were able to make in yeast. And Novo Nordisk now supplies one half of the world's product of human insulin for clinical use uh, using this process in yeast. So, you know, I like to think our fundamental studies in just trying to figure out how a little yeast hormone gets made by the cells led to a great benefit to a great many people. And even today, here's a paper from uh, 2013, uh, two months ago, August 2013, talking about production of biopharmaceutical proteins by yeast. Insulin and insulin analogs are by far the dominating biopharmaceuticals produced by yeast. Other important biopharmaceuticals produced by yeast are human serum albumin. That's really important for uh, uh, blood transfusions. Um, hepatitis vaccines and virus-like particles used for vaccination against human papillomavirus. So other things that are made by biopharma companies that we put into our bodies are prepared in yeast. And that's because yeast is... You know, we've eaten it, we've consumed it, we know it's, it's non-toxic, and so it's a, it's a good organism to produce things in. If you do it in bacteria, bacteria have all sorts of products that cause our inflammatory system to go, go crazy. The same is not true of yeast. Okay, that's vignette number one. Uh, vignette number two has to do with malaria. Another microbe, in this case another eukaryotic microbe, that's really bad and causes a lot of death and disease in many parts of the world still. And the name of the organism that causes this disease is the trypanosome Plasmodium falciparum. And as some of you may be aware, it has a dual life cycle. Uh, a mosquito comes and sucks the blood of an infected person. The plasmodium persists and 
flourishes in the bloodstream of a mosquito and forms a, a traveling salesman kind of version called a sporozoite. And then the next time that mosquito bites an uninfected person, it injects with it some of its saliva the, the sporozoites, and that infects the liver, which then spreads to our red blood cells, and uh, the um, merozoite form of plasmodium uh, really likes to chew up the hemoglobin as a carbon and energy source in our red blood cells and make more of itself, and then they fill up the bloodstream, and then another and it's terrible. So the story I want to tell you in this regard has to do with somebody who joined our faculty uh, much after I did, but he's been here ever since he joined, never had any other job, always been here, and that's Jay Keesling. Oh, what happened to his name? I, somehow I lost his name. Terribly sorry, Jay. This is J.D. Keesling. He's a professor in our uh, chemical engineering and also our bioengineering departments. And he uh, has helped develop a field that's often referred to as synthetic biology, uh, could also be called metabolic engineering. And um, he specifically used this with support that my wife actually helped get for him from the Gates Foundation to solve the problem of making a compound that would combat malaria at a price that the countries where malaria is endemic can really afford and help beat back the disease. So this all starts with um, some ancient lore, some herbal medicine knowledge that comes from China. As oftentimes is the case, I mean, that's how we found out about aspirin. It came from herbal use of uh, the bark of the tree that, that uh, aspirin comes from. Same way, the Chinese knew that the, uh, they could extract from this plant the sweet wormwood, uh, I'll call it Artemisia, Annua, uh, a compound, artemisinin, artemisinin, it's pronounced in various ways, but artemisinin, it's not so easy. And that this compound was really good at inhibiting the proliferation of the malarial parasite. So Jay said as his goal, is there some way we could engineer a microorganism to actually make this compound? And we know a lot, uh, Leo Parks up at Oregon State, uh, uh, another chap at uh, Indiana University, had worked out uh, essentially all of the steps in yeast that are necessary to make the precursor molecules that are, are known as polyisoprenes, the same kind of compounds that plants make in secrete in latex that we use to make natural rubber. So all of these genes were known in yeast and they are needed to make the building block that goes together to form the pre immediate precursor of artemisinic acid which then can be converted to artemisinin very easily by a chemical process. And the, Jay has been, uh, he's the last author on this paper, but Jay has been tweaking, and part of the reason I'm including this is Patrick J. Westfall was a postdoc in my lab before he joined uh, Jay's group to, to help this actually get accomplished. And um, just now in 2013, they've gotten really high level production because they can make a ton, they can make 25 grams of this precursor in one liter of yeast culture. And to do that, they had to engineer into the strain ways of each of these green um, designations here is the name of an enzyme that's produced by a gene. So the ERG10 gene makes a protein that's important for converting this intermediate acetyl-CoA into mevalonate. This is the first step in the polyisoprene pathway. And they engineered each of these green things to be overexpressed at a very high level in response to a cube that you could add to the cells. And likewise, all of these things in the box here, including this one out of the box, ADS, they're all plant genes. They all come from that sweet wormwood plant. They're genes that they had to engineer, get out of the plant, figure out what the enzymes did, put them into yeast, put them under the control of the same regulatable promoters so they could tune it, and in response to the right signal, the cell makes all of these things in green, which diverts all of the carbon flow that the cells are making 
into pumping out 25 grams of the precursor of artemisinin, and then they just use UV light and a singlet oxygen generator to stick the oxygen molecules in here to make artemisinin. So they can make, by, by this process, the, the estimates were that there wasn't enough sweet wormwood in the world, even if you had sweet wormwood forest farms, to extract enough artemisinin to effectively treat malaria worldwide. And even if you did, it would cost about $10 a dose. And now, Jay, through this process, the dose is down to pennies a dose. So now, again, even countries that aren't very well off can afford to treat their populace, and hopefully we can maybe get to the point where we can eradicate this disease. Okay, the third vignette I wanted to tell you about is about cancer. And this is the structure of a protein, or again, a ribbon diagram of a protein that's referred to as the RAS proto-oncoprotein. If you know anybody who's unfortunately suffered from colorectal cancer or other cancers, mainly of the digestive tract, um, in 90% of those cancers, there are mutations in this protein that make it permanently in its active form. So this is a protein that cycles between an off state and an on state. And in many types of cancer, among the mutations found in those cancer cells are things that have mutated this protein to turn it permanently into the on state. And how this protein works is um, in part of uh, the research interests of another colleague of mine, Jasper Ryan, who came to Berkeley in 1982, and he's also been here ever since. And Jasper is a professor in a different division. You know, Steve mentioned I'm in the division of biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology. Jasper is in the division of genetics, genomics, and development of the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology, but we're all brothers in that great fraternity, the Mystic Knights of the Sea. Uh, how many of you ever heard Amos and Andy on the radio? Anyway. Um, so Jasper has been interested in whether or not he could figure out whether there is some way to subvert the action of those mutagenic, those cancer-causing RAS proteins that are found in tumors. So I have to give you a little background about how RAS does its thing. And normally, in every cell in our bodies, there are molecules that sit in this layer that we call the plasma membrane around every cell, and embedded in that plasma membrane are receptors, RTKs. Doesn't matter what it stands for, but they respond to normal signals that our body makes to tell cells when to proliferate and when not to, when to uh, differentiate from one cell type into another cell type, um, when to make a cell surface adhesion molecule that allows you to stick to another cell type, and when not to. And part of that circuitry by which the stimulus, this extracellular ligand here, L, just a molecule of some sort that engages these receptors. What happens is there's some machinery here. Uh, by the way, this machinery was worked out by another former Cal professor, uh, Gerald M. Rubin, who now runs the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Genelia Farm Research Center in Virginia. But when he was a Cal faculty member, he figured out all this process. So, as I said before, we all stand on the shoulders of other, even they're not giants, we all stand on the shoulders of somebody. And, um, and so it was known that this machinery, one of the things it has to do is to turn this protein from its off state to its on state. So it goes from binding this molecule called GDP to binding a molecule called GDP. It doesn't matter what it is. This is off. This is on. And then once it's on, transiently, there's something that always shuts it off. It turns on by interacting with other things other things that make the cells respond in the appropriate way. But you can imagine, if you had a mutation in this protein that kept it permanently always in this on state, it's always stimulating these other factors. And many of these other factors promote growth, and they promote the survival of the cells. So those cells wind up having a selective advantage over any other cell in the body. They're told to keep growing, keep surviving, keep growing, keep surviving, even in the face of things trying to combat them. And so that's why those cells proliferate and form a tumor. Now, RAS is a membrane-associated protein, but it wasn't really understood how and why RAS 
likes to have a location parked at the plasma membrane waiting for these signals to come and turn it on. And Jasper initially was studying how the other mating ferrum, remember for our, us to produce insulin, we took advantage of what we figured out about how pre-pro alpha factor is made and just substituted insulin for the alpha factor portion. In this case, Jasper was looking at what's necessary to make the A mating factor. And he discovered that right at the end of the molecule is a little signal that decorates the protein with a C15 farnesyl group. We're getting back to those isoprene compounds. And then the end of this molecule is, is also made uh, blocked by putting on this uh, methyl ester group. The, the, the end point of putting these things on is that we've added a greasy finger onto the end of this molecule, which helps target it to the membrane for its export outside of the cell, and then it acts like a hormone on those. And Jasper realized that right at the end of the RAS protein, there's a sequence that looks the same, which has now come to be called a CAX box. A residue of the amino acid cysteine, which has a sulfur atom to which you attach the polyisoprene group. And two aliphatic amino acids, which means they're greasy, and then no bias, amino acid X. And here's the end of RAS, here's a cysteine with its sulfur atom, the two aliphatic AAX, and this, I hope it's not too dark to see, can, can you see the wording here? And again, a farnesyl chain gets added to that sulfur, a carboxyl group with a negative charge, uh, membranes are net negatively charged, they have a lot of phosphate groups, so having charge, charge repulsion keeps it off the membrane, so you can block that negative charge by putting on a methyl ester, and now, because of the grease and the block of the negative charge, it can now associate with the membrane. So, using this information, Jasper and our colleague Sun Ho Kim in chemistry, and yours truly was in on this, uh, we proposed that uh, oncogenic mutations in yeast in humans might be ameliorated by blocking the ability of the protein to get to the membrane. And here he said, these observations establish a connection between the cholesterol biosynthetic pathway and transformation by the RAS oncogene and offer a novel pharmacological approach to investigating and possibly controlling RAS-mediated malignant transformations. And there are indeed still companies out there, there's a paper from last year, 2012, where they're talking about all the different pharmaceutical companies that have made various inhibitors that block the enzyme, the isoprenal transferase that puts that group on RAS proteins and how these are trying, still being used and trying to develop ones that will be of clinical value uh, to combat cancer. All right, in the, in the last 10 minutes, I want to tell you the fourth and last vignette. And this has to do with another human affliction, which is asthma, and here's a poor young, very young child who's suffering from asthma and has to, when they have an attack of constriction of their airway, they have to breathe um, um, beta adrenergic receptor agonist called albuterol, uh, which stimulates a pathway that relaxes the smooth muscles around their airway cells and opens up their airway passages so they can breathe better. Um, and, but uh, people very rapid, especially if they start using it at a young age, uh, develop desensitization. Uh, they don't respond to albuterol very well. Anymore. They have to use higher and higher doses, and using too much beta agonist is bad for you in other ways. Um, so, what factors actually contribute to somebody getting asthma? Well, over time, people have studied families and genetic mutations and people that seem to, to do this, but very excitingly, um, in 2007, a paper came out in a very prestigious journal, Nature, suggesting that genetic variants, you know, like that, uh, suggesting that genetic variants uh, in a human gene on one of our chromosomes, chromosome 17, uh, that caused upregulation of the expression, of, according to this story, upregulation of the expression of, the, of a gene, ORMDL3, that seemed to contribute 
to the risk of a child getting asthma. And how was this done? Well, this depended on the advent of genomics and genomic sequencing. They took families where they could trace the pedigrees of the children to their parents and their grandparents and that sort of thing, and just asked which people were afflicted with the disease and which weren't, and was there any change in their genome sequence that correlated with their propensity to get asthma. And they, this group in England, led by uh, William Cookson, claimed that genetic variants around this locus that changed its level of expression were important for conferring on people the possibility of getting asthma, being more susceptible to getting asthma. Well, we got really excited about this for the following reason. We were working on something totally different in yeast. Again, yeast informs us about lots of things. We were interested in how does a yeast cell know which membrane lipids to put in its lipids. And it does that in several ways. It controls the rate of synthesis of the lipids that go in the membrane, but it also controls enzymes that flip lipids. So our membrane is a bilayer of two lipids, and they have to be in the right place, either on the outside or the inside. And if they aren't, there are enzymes that say, oh, you're in the wrong place, I'm going to flip you back to the right side, inside. And there are other enzymes called floppases that do the opposite. They recognize a lipid is on the inside, and that's the wrong place, and they flop it to the outside. And we were studying the set of enzymes that regulate that, those functions. And we found that one of the things that the crucial enzyme we were studying controls was a yeast protein called ORM2. And you notice ORM here. And this was in 2002. And nothing was known about what ORM2 did in yeast. And nothing was known about what any of its related proteins in other organisms did. So when we published this in 2002, we said, well, we know one of the things our enzyme has to do is control this protein, suppress the function of this protein, but we don't know what this protein does. Nonetheless, it made it very exciting. The ORMDL3 is one of three human relatives, the, basically the equivalent. Here's the three human proteins, ORMDL1, 2, and 3. They're very similar to each other. And here are the two yeast ORM proteins, and they're very similar to ORMDL3. Um, you know, GTPFE, GTPFD, D and E are very similar for reasons you don't have to tell you, but THWEQA and THW, they're very, very similar proteins. They have <coughs> the same yellow regions, but it doesn't matter what they are, just take my word for it, they're similar. So, what do these ORM proteins do? Well, this was solved across the day at UCSF by my colleague Jonathan Weissman and his grad student David Breslau in doing other research in yeast. They found that the yeast ORM proteins sit in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane and their job is to inhibit an enzyme that the cells need to make one of the kinds of lipids that's in the membrane called sphingolipids. Doesn't matter what sphingolipids are or do, they just have to be made in the plasma membrane. So that solved the problem of what the ORM proteins actually do. And we got together with Jonathan and we showed that yes indeed the enzyme that we're studying does in fact control, negatively control those proteins. So when you go back to the observation made in 2007, what Mr. Cookson, Dr. Cookson claimed is that genetic variants regulating ORM DL3 are the determinants of susceptibility to childhood asthma. And what he suggested was that too much expression of this protein was bad. It gave, gave people the propensity to get asthma. Just three years after that, uh, a group, a different group, totally different group, found ORM DL3, mutations around ORM DL3, is also contributing to another human inflammatory disease, ulcerative colitis. And it is an interesting clinical observation that many people who suffer from asthma also have gastrointestinal symptoms. So we asked ourselves, um, what is it about the bronchial epithelium and what is it about the intestinal epithelium that they have in common such that if they overexpressed ORM, and if 
in humans, the job of orm was like it is in yeast. We, Breslau and we showed that these orm proteins inhibit the ability of cells to synthesize sphingolipids. And a friend of mine in Geneva, Howard Riesman, showed that in yeast, too few sphingolipids prevents proteins that are on the surface from being recaptured into, into the cells, a process called endocytosis. So our prediction from what we knew in yeast was too much orm, too little sphingolipid. Too little sphingolipid, proteins on the surface are going to stay there. And what proteins are on the surface of our bronchial epithelia and our intestinal epithelia? Well, one of the major classes of such molecules are known as TLRs, toll-like receptors. They're critical molecules in our innate immune system. They are the molecules in the surface of cells that respond to bacterial products, like lipopeptides, lipopolysaccharides, bacteria, flagellin. They're our first wave of defense. And what are the two portals where you're first going to encounter dust mites, bacteria, dander, you're either going to ingest it, or you're going to breathe it in. And that's why these molecules sit on the surface of those cells, acting as sentinels, telling us whether or not we've actually encountered anything like that. And then they send out signals, they secrete things that turn on our antibody-producing cells. So we thought that possibly, if the properties of mammalian epithelial cells are like yeast, as has been the case for everything else, Mammalian cells secrete and process insulin by the same enzymes that yeast use, or relatives thereof. They process their RAS protein by the same relatives that process the A-factor pheromone and yeast and RAS proteins in yeast. We thought, if the elevation in ORMDL3 suppresses sphingolipid synthesis, then that's going to prevent these TLRs from getting brought into the cell. And when these TLRs engage their antigen, when they're exposed to their stimuli, they send signals that turn on inflammation and get our body to mount an immune response. And if they cannot be shut off, then they're going to stay in their chronically activated state, which is going to cause even more permanent inflammation and might be the underlying cause of susceptibility. So myself and a colleague here, Greg Barton, who's an immunologist in our Division of Immunology and Pathogenesis in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. Uh, we wrote a grant for the American Asthma Foundation, which was awarded, and actually right in the back of the room is Subhul Ramachandran, one of the postdocs in my lab who's pursuing this idea of whether or not sphingolipid biosynthesis has anything to do with chronic inflammatory signaling and asthma. And it's now noontime, so I'll be happy to take any questions, and go Bears. I hope we win the game today. It'll be the second one we won. Yes. At the beginning, you were talking about A cells and alpha cells. Are these uh, alpha cells containing organelles already? Yes. So. Um, So this is a, just a, an electron micrograph. It's a thin section. If you took a watermelon and cut it in half and looked at the red and the seed, where the seeds are on the section, that's what you're looking at here. And this is a section through a typical yeast cell, and A and an alpha would look virtually indistinguishable. They have the nucleus and the vacuole and mitochondria and other kinds of inclusions. This is probably a peroxisome. Um, it's a little hard to see the Golgi in yeast cells, but you know, because they don't form such beautiful stacks, but this is probably a little pluriferal ER here uh, along, the, along the membrane. But well, you said the word molecule, and I didn't quite understand how this fitted in which molecule is being transferred. Um, in, for, for A and alpha? Yeah. So, so who are these? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, let's go, go ahead here. <laughs> Maybe, you know, in 
the next one. So this little 13 residue segment of this bigger, so this is 165 amino acids long, but there are four repeats that are just 13 amino acids long here, and snipped and cut and blah, decorated blah, blah, all the way as it's sort of moving through those membrane compartments out of the cell, and finally what gets spit out in the secretory vesicles get fused with the membrane and dump their contents is just this little, well, four copies from each precursor of this little 13 residue molecule. And then, um, uh, here, it's a, an 11 residue molecule, but it's decorated with the grease on, on the end. And this is, this is A factor. And alpha factor has got a different sequence, tripis, trip, glutamine, glutamine, proglide, glutamine, promet, tyrosine. Uh, and this has got a different sequence. Um, uh, 11 residues instead of 13, totally different language. But the same general idea, a short little secreted hormone that goes and binds to the other cell and tells it what to do. And it, it acts, all of these molecules, um, so I, I mentioned that certain ligands act through these kinds of receptors. The small peptides in mm -hmm. our bodies, so oxytocin, vasopressin, bradykinin, somatostatin, things, you know, angiotensin that controls your blood pressure. They lock to a different class, still embedded in the membrane, but it's a different class of receptor called the GPCR. Last year, uh, Brian Kobilka down at Stanford and his former boss, Robert Lefkowitz at Duke, got the Nobel Prize for their studies on the structure and function of GPCR. Uh, but the yeast hormones act through GPCRs, and the second and third GPCRs ever cloned in sequence were the yeast sterile 2 and sterile 3 proteins. But nobody, nobody got the Nobel Prize for in the back. In your four vignettes, can you explain what the role of the periplasm and the cell wall are? You haven't mentioned anything about it. So yeah. It um, uh, I only mentioned uh, in my very introductory remarks uh, the debt I owe to my former colleague, uh, he's still with us, but Clinton E. Blue, who um, did a lot of work studying the structure of the yeast cell wall. That was one of his primary contributions. So let's go back there since somebody asked about that picture. So as that gentleman's pointing out, see CW, uh, that's not a network, it stands for cell wall, and you can see all the hairy fuzz here. So this black line is the plasma membrane, but outside of that is a rigidity conferring layer called the cell wall that basically encases the cell in a meshwork bag. Or if it were a basketball, it's, it's the tough coating around the, the bladder that you actually pump up. To. And the reason for that is that yeast mainly lives in hypotonic environments. It lives in fluids that have less dissolved material, less dissolved solutes in it than the concentration inside the cytoplasm. So, the uh, laws of osmotic pressure would say if it's more concentrated inside, then water is going to try and flow in, and that would cause the cell to expand and eventually it would burst, unless there was some counteracting force to counteract that hydrostatic pressure, and that's what this very cross-linked, very thick cell wall uh, does. And a, the cutoff of this meshwork. It's not um, like a concrete barrier. It's, it's more like a, a snood. It's got cross links, but it's got holes in it. And uh, molecules of uh, like 40 to 60,000 molecular weight are too big to get out of there. And so as he's saying, they get trapped in like, let's see this little white spot here. So here's the cell wall, here's the plasma. And you can see this little white area. That's referred to as the periplasmic space the space around the outside of the plasma membrane, but inside the cell wall. But alpha factor and A factor, for example, are so tiny, they just pass right through. They are e easily able to diffuse out. But what um, about the budding process? What role does it play there? Um, that's a very interesting point. So in mammalian cells, in mammalian cells, um, you set up, you target to this place where cell division is going to happen, a process called cytokinesis. You target an actomyosin complex 
that constricts down like the iris diaphragm in an old camera. I mean, pretty soon I won't be able to use that analogy because everyone has cell phone cameras and nobody will have iris diagrams on a real camera. But it closes down the actomyosin, instead of like muscle, actomyosin is in our skeletal muscle, but there's also actomyosin that does other, of other types that does other things, and it, and it pinches down the neck like that. And yeast has that too. Has exactly that same actomyosin complex that pinches it down. However, in growth of the cell wall, what creates um, this bud scar is the deposition of a different class of cell wall polysaccharide called chitin. And you know, you've all hit a lobster shell or crushed an insect. The exoskeletons of arthropods are all made out of chitin, which unfortunately we can't digest. And so part of the division process here is not only the constriction of the actomyosin, but the deposition of what's known as the primary septum, which is the synthesis of the chitin that leaves that bud scar. And um, a fellow named Erfe B, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, he studied this process when he was a postdoc with John Pringle at the University of North Carolina. And Pringle's now, his, his wife got recruited to head up the uh, cancer center at at Stanford, so he's now a faculty member at Stanford, but uh, Erf A.B. and John Pringle showed that if you have defects in the actomyosin, then the yeast cell can manage to divide anyway because it lays down that chitin septum. If you destroy the ability to make the chitin, they can still manage to make a bud, but it's not, not always that healthy but because they have the actomyosin. It's only when you get rid of both of them that you really block a cell from budding. And so yeast is sort of a hybrid. Plants don't have any actomyosin. They, they lay down a cellulosic wall, a so-called cell plate. And so yeast is kind of halfway in between. It lays down the chitin plate, if you want to think of it that way, and it has actomyosin. And both together make the process extremely robust, but it can get by with one or the other. Does that get at what you were asking? Yeah. In this planning process, when and how does the nucleus of the inflammation yeah. Um, so on the surface of the, the nucleus is something called the spindle pole bodies, and they have the same function, analogous function as the centrosomes in a mammalian cell, and they are microtubule organizing centers. And so those spindle pole bodies, uh, there's initially one in the nucleus, it duplicates, it rotates around to the other side. Microtubules make connections to, there are proteins called the polarisome that give the cell directionality. And they establish connections of the microtubules to here. And so one spindle pole is anchored with the microtubules on one side, and that draws the nucleus, like, and it wedges itself like a cork in a bottle in the isthmus between the mother and the bud. And then the spindle gets assembled, and then the chromosomes are segregated half year, half year. And then the nuclear envelope pinches down and um, divides at the sort of the same place. Uh, in fact, if you have premature cell division, you get what's known as a cut phenotype. You can break your chromosomes because the growth of the cell wall in there can actually destroy the chromosomes. So the timing has to be just right. If you do the segregation, and then you make the cell wall, not the other way around. Um, is that kind of what you're? Yeah, this gets back to the question this gentleman asked about um, homothallic strains. And um, when, you, when you look, if you, if, you, if you take a strain that has the enzyme that can allow for this genetic conversion of a cell from A to alpha or from alpha to A, you never see the mother cell, sorry, you never see the bud change its mating type. So let's say you start with a mother that's an A. It'll bud, and it'll give an A, and we don't have to go into how we tell it's an A, but for example, if it makes A factor, it's an A. If it responds to alpha factor, it's an A. Uh, there are properties of those cells. Um, so an A mother will give an A bud, and another A bud, but then every once in a while, it'll give an alpha. 
but the mother itself, oh, sorry, the, that's, I'm saying it backwards, I said it backwards twice now, it's the other way around. The bud is A, the bud is A, and then the mother will switch to alpha, and then it will give alpha buds, alpha. So you, ha you can't, no naive cell ever switches. Only a, a, you know, a, a mother cell that's gone through at least one division is, has the capacity to switch. And we know why and how that is, and it has to do with expression of the HO gene and changes in the structure of the chromatin that allow the recombination of that to happen and things like that. And um, I think in the early days it was used as an analogy for proliferation of a undifferentiated cell type. Because you have an A cell that stays, you know, every bud that you make stays that same type and only the mother switches and differentiates into something else. Um, I, I, you know, it's not a great analogy. What it's more akin to is how our antibody genes undergo a type switching, um, how we get recombination within the same chromosome to make our different classes of antibodies. The other? Any environmental effects that affect the changes in neurons? Um, yes. So yeast really like a P, um, acidic pHs, pHs below neutral. So if things get a little too alkaline, they don't grow. Um, most yeast don't like to grow at too high a temperature. 37, 38, 39 is about the maximum uh, for most yeasts. So if it gets too hot, they, they, won't, they won't grow that well. They, they like it a little cooler. Their optimal temperature for growth is 30 degrees centigrade. Well, in humans, you know, environment over time can affect lots of different expressions of genes that are not normally expressed. I don't know that. Also oh, ab absolutely. So, um, for example, I mentioned Kiesling um, used a way to turn on the expression of all those green things so that they were all made at the same time so that they would all pump the carbon into that pathway and make 25 grams. Uh, he used uh, the, the, the way you turn a gene on in that regulated fashion you're talking about has to do with what's known as its promoter. And uh, his, his brother, the fellow sitting right in front of you, Stan Fields, has done a lot of work on, on gene promoters in yeast. And um, he used uh, the galactose promoter. So again, when you grow yeast on sucrose or raffinose or maltose or glucose or any other carbon source except galactose, those genes are off. You add galactose to the culture, those genes come on and they say, oh, we now have a new carbon source we have to degrade. And so they express those genes. But it, it's part of the cellular economy. You don't make what you don't need because it would be wasteful. And so evolution, as you're pointing out, evolution has constructed that kind of circuitry. Hey, we're not always going to encounter galactose. We shouldn't be making those genes until we encounter galactose. And cells that didn't squander their resources doing that had a selective advantage over cells that did squander their resources doing it. So that's how we, you know, the circuitry of that can evolve. Um, 